devices do you have? Two? Three? Count them all up in your head. iPhone, laptop, tablet, Kindle, internet connected, smart toaster, all of them. On each of these devices, you're targeted. In the same place you receive emails from your lovely old grandma, you get the occasional plea for help from a Nigerian prince or someone pretending to be your grandma who really wants you to open this weird looking attachment. When you check the news on your devices, you hear about how we're getting hacked left, right, center by everyone. If the Russians don't have your social security information, the Chinese definitely have your credit card number. So, we read the news, we get hacked, and the blame usually falls on one of two parties, the government or the private sector. How could the State Department have such weak security systems, or how could Facebook have let the Russians propagate fake news? Why are we, the consumers and citizens, suffering? Growing up, I've always wanted to work in the government, which can be strange when all of my peers in cybersecurity are vying for spots on the hottest startup. But in this moment, I'd like to use my experience as someone who's worked for both the government and the tech sectors to offer up a piece of the security puzzle, one that doesn't usually make the big headlines. Effectively, the government and the private sector think about cybersecurity in completely contrasting ways. A lot of this has to do with how they're set up and what their long-term goals are. For the private sector, cyber is an industry. If you're not a cybersecurity company, you don't think about cyber past your last software update. Most of these companies don't work together and all of them are focused on turning a profit. For the government, cyber is a domain, like air, sea, land, and space. Its mission is to defend the US homeland from cyber threats and thus has a bunch of departments trying to work together to both produce and consume security products. And sometimes these products are also brought in from the private sector. So, because these two parties are so different and don't really communicate, public and private cy cybersecurity doesn't work out as well as it should. Let's go back to this internet connected toaster, which is a real thing, by the way. This bizarre invention is part of a wider array of products called the Internet of Things, or IoT. Basically, computers have become so cheap that engineers have realized we can make our homes smart. Our security camera can connect to our phone when we go on vacation. Our coffee machine can make that double mocha latte at precisely 7 a.m. when we roll out of bed. And our toaster can imprint photos on toast for some reason. <laughs> Consumers, all of us, we went nuts. Yes, this is great. We're living in the future. And businesses saw this. Here was a product that was incredibly in demand, could be manufactured cheaply, and then sold at an exorbitant price. Businesses saw an opportunity to make a profit, and thus sold hordes of IoT devices at increasingly cheaper costs to compete in this market. As costs got cheaper, quality went down. As quality went down, security got left out of the building process. Many of these devices, DVRs, routers especially, had hard-coded passwords. Now, what this means is if you have a router and you can log into that router, you can now log in to any other router anywhere in the world made by this company because they all have the same unchangeable password. What could possibly go wrong? On October 21st, 2016, somebody took advantage of all of these hard-coded passwords and logged on to over 100,000 devices. This actor then used these devices to attack Dyn, a company that essentially provides easy access to the internet. Dyn's servers went down, and the internet for the entire northeastern United States and parts of Europe went down for an entire business day. Okay, so the internet was down for a day, who cares? We do, everyone does. We've become so interconnected that the internet is a key resource. When a natural disaster occurs, reporters give estimates on when the Wi-Fi will be back up. When Facebook is down, people actually dial 911. <laughs> 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 
But in terms of dollars and cents on that day, huge conglomerates like CNN, Airbnb, Spotify, couldn't conduct regular business. People who had to browse certain sites for their jobs simply had to go home. And all of this occurred because companies were so focused on pushing out the newest, hottest product, the cheapest internet-connected toaster, instead of taking a hard look at how their lack of security could hurt consumers. Then, surely, the private sector can learn from the government, right? The government doesn't update its products much, which is understandable. It takes a long time to figure out how a new piece of technology can impact national security, so government products are evaluated extensively before integration. But instead of pushing out products as fast as possible, the government has fallen into an opposite problem. After decades without update, technologies can become slow and incompatible with newer systems with parts that are impossible to repair or vulnerabilities that are impossible to fix. Because it takes so long for governments to understand how a new upgrade could impact us, they become wary of the upgrades themselves. But the old systems, legacy systems, become threats to national security simply because of how old they are. Here's a scary example. The United States holds over 440 Minuteman III nuclear missiles housed in land silos all across the country. These missiles are constantly on high alert just in case, you know, someone wants to lob a nuke our way. What's alarming is that the communication system for these missiles, which sends and receives orders from the president, has malfunctioned on multiple occasions. This system is comprised of eight-inch floppy disks, a computer from 1976, and other hardware that's over 50 years old. In the 1980s, a malfunction from this system caused the United States to believe that the Soviet Union had sent over 220, no, 2,200 nuclear missiles towards the United States. Advisors were about to recommend a counterattack, effectively starting World War III, before engineers thankfully found the issue. Scares like this elevated tensions during the Cold War, and this particular scare happened twice. Because of this, it was recommended that the Minuteman III communication system be either retired or updated in the 1980s. But this still hasn't happened. The most recent schedule for update has a completion date of 2020. While the Soviet Union is no longer around, we now have North Korea to worry about, and these malfunctions could happen again. These aren't isolated events, but are caused by a larger difference in worldview. People like us in the private sector, unless we work in cybersecurity, don't stop to think about how new products could cause us harm. It's not our fault. We live in a time of progress, a time of great change at great speed. Many of us are net natives. Because we grew up with the internet, we think it could change the world given the chance. Facebook's 2.1 billion connections reach across borders, leaving us with pure, unfiltered human bond. Or, you know, if we just drop 500 flash drives with information about democracy over North Korea, Kim Jong-un will be powerless to stop the will of the people. Unfortunately, the same internet that we herald as this great equalizer also leaves us vulnerable. Facebook's Unfiltered human connection led to Russian interference in the US elections. South Korean nonprofits have become victims of North Korean cyber attacks by advertising their flash drive drops over the internet. We become so enamored with the possible benefits that a technology can bring that we don't stop to consider the detriments. Governments, on the other hand, don't usually see technological solutions. It's not their fault either. As of May 2016, there were only four net natives in Congress. Only one Democrat and three Republicans came from a technology-based background. We can't fault our legislators for not growing up with the internet. 
but we can fault them when they don't really understand or try to understand what they regulate. Over the course of my undergraduate career, I've had the distinct pleasure and honor to talk to and ask questions to individuals in our government, our military, and in think tanks specifically about cybersecurity. About 20% of the time, I get one of the following. Cyber is just not important to my job, or I don't really understand the internet. My grandson sets up my router. Thankfully, I see these answers less and less. I really hope it's because these important individuals in our government have figured out that cyber is important to their job, even if it's not in their job description. I really hope it's not just because they found someone else to set up their router. Worse than Minuteman systems or grandsons, this public-private communication gap is the biggest legacy system in cybersecurity. For the government, the problem is a lack of understanding and innovation, something that the private sector is abundant in. The private sector, meanwhile, moves too quickly without thought of regulation and security, something that the government can rein in with good regulation. Thankfully, both sides have started to figure this out and are working on the issue. But the internet isn't just made up of companies and governments. It's added to, modified, viewed by users. Everyone in this room has the unique ability to understand how technology affects the world around us. It does not take an engineering degree to understand that. And it only takes a moment to consider security before you buy. Has this company been hacked before? Does this router have a hard-coded password? Do I really need this cheaply made internet-connected toaster? Also, as citizens, we have the ability to keep governments accountable by rallying around good security policy. We work hard to build our futures, traveling the globe, starting a family, finding that dream job. And so, as you leave these talks today to go pursue that future, whatever it may be, I hope that you consider making it a secure one. Thank you.